Luke chapter 1, verse 26. Now in the sixth month, an angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And having come, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. And she was troubled at his saying, and considered the manner of greeting it was. And then the angel uh, said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth... Your relative has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. But with God nothing will be impossible. And then Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, we ask, Lord God, that you would open our hearts to see, Lord, the, the incredible, Lord God, um, servant attitude, uh, love, Lord God, Open this to your gift that this young woman, Mary, had and how she was selected amongst all the women of the earth to be, Lord God, the mother of the humanity of our Savior, Jesus. And that we would learn from her, Lord God, and we would learn of our humble, humble attitude, Lord God, of her attitude of faith, of her worshiping attitude. And Father God, we would take this to heart tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So you'll be seated. So Joseph, again, we're talking about Joseph and Mary, and I said to you last week, why did God select Joseph? And we talked about a number of reasons as to why God selected Joseph, and I want to tonight talk to you about, I believe, why the Lord selected Mary. And I'm going to share with you a number of reasons. Things that, again, we could take to heart and apply to our lives. The first thing, uh, Mary's submissive heart. And, um, you know, you see it in the passage that I had just read to you. Now, if you look again, verses 36 and 37, the angel Gabriel comes to her and he says to her, Rejoice, right? There is joy that is going to fill your life. He calls her highly favored. And the word there, highly favored, is the word essentially grace, charisma. Um, by the way, if you are in Christ, you have received the high favor of God. His favor is upon you. It says, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you amongst women. Any of us who have come from the Roman Catholic background, we learned the Hail Mary when we were going to make a communion. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. By the way, that's all from Scripture. By the way, blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. And that's also Elizabeth, what Elizabeth says to uh, Mary. Now, this is where Holy Mary, and when they add on Mother of God, that's not a suspicion. Mary is not the Mother of God. God has no mother. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have no mother. She is the mother of the humanity of Jesus. Uh -huh. And uh, that is where there is a divide. By the way, I, I taught that here once, and there was a man here who had such an aversion to the Catholic Church. When I taught when that, that, that what I just said to you, right, just, just plain old scripture, and I said what is not in scripture, he got so infuriated, he left the church and never came back. He, um, he was so angry. But again, that's scripture. And, you know, put, put aside your prejudices, and uh, there are obviously, uh, you know, Three quarters of that prayer is true based on Scripture. I don't know if we're praying to Mary, we pray to the Lord. But um, essentially, what, what God has done, he says, you're blessed amongst women. God, I believe, placed 23 chromosomes, male chromosomes, into Mary's um, egg. And I believe that is, you know, essentially it was called, it created what's called the deployed cell, um, except it had no sin, right? There was no taint in it, there was no sin nature passed on. And um, the sinless Savior is, you know, is born from that. And uh, when you look again at this, just what an honor, right? Now let me just say this to you, and you understand this. When God bestows an honor on a person, let me tell you, the honor of salvation comes with some tremendous challenges. And this honor that is bestowed upon Mary Came with some tremendous challenges. And I think we look at this and say, wow, the favor of the Lord, blessed are you amongst women, rejoice, highly favored one, and you look at that, 
And I just want you to, you know, you got to kind of like read between the lines of what happens here. Now Mary has to tell her fiancé, who is betrothed to her, Joseph, hey, an angel came to me. Hmm. This angel was named Gabriel. And um, he basically said to me, you're going to be pregnant. And you're going to be pregnant, and this is going to be this great miracle, and you're going to carry to term the Messiah, and his name shall be Jesus. Now put yourself in that situation. What do you think Joseph's reaction was? And we know from what we saw last week. It was to put her away and divorce her. To do it uh, honorably and gracefully and not have her stoned. But he had to have totally, like, I mean, could, would you like to have seen that conversation of just like him looking at her and saying, what, what are, you, are you kidding me? What are you out of your mind? You expect me to believe this? Then she has to go. You know, just the father could have had Mary stoned as well. And she's got to go and she's got to tell her, her father and mother this. Spirit right, speaks to Joseph, the angel comes and gives him the vision, and he says, you know, you, you, your wife is pregnant by the Holy Spirit, and she's going to bring forth a son, and his name shall be Jesus. I don't know what the situation with the father is, but now she's in this small town called Nazareth, you know what little towns are like? You know, when you're in a little little circle of people, you know, you're for your own families. We don't have many small towns anymore, but gossip? Imagine the things that were said about her, slander. You know, some people, they, they love to hear bad things about other people. And now they've heard this, this bad thing about, you know, about Mary, who was betrothed to be married to Joseph, and... You know, why do people love to hear bad things? Because people have miserable little lives, and you know what? They like to hear miserable little stories about other people. It somehow makes them feel good. But she's in this situation. In fact, there were, there were, there were rumors passed about Mary and the birth of Jesus that you can find these among some Jewish writings that a Roman soldier impregnated Mary and Jesus was the son of a Roman soldier. One of the blasphemies that you know that was perpetrated. So here's the, you know again this this situation where I mean there was a huge there was a huge amount of honor and there is a, a huge amount of challenge in all of this. And whenever God bestows an honor on us, there is always a price to be paid. And that is the, the truth about salvation. Salvation is a free gift, and when you receive it. There is a price, there is a cost, there is a challenge that comes with it. Anybody who's, who's come to Christ, genuinely, truly come to Christ, you have been walking with the Lord for now, you know this is true. And Jesus, you know what, Jesus, and again, he never mixed words about this, never sugarcoated this. Look what it tells us in Luke chapter 14, verse 25 to 33. Now multitudes went with him. And here's a multitude following him, and he, he did this frequently. He turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, uh, he cannot be my disciple. Another word there again, hate, is you must love God far more than you love people in your life. That's, that's, that's what the word means. So obviously Jesus is not teaching us to hate our family members and hate our children and hate our spouse, hate our fathers. And obviously the Bible teaches everything about us loving them, but that we are to love God supremely above them. And I'll just tell you this. Put your kids, put your wife before God, and you're going to be in a heap of trouble. A heap of trouble. By the way, when I've watched parents put their kids above God, I've seen some very difficult things turn out with the kids. You've got, you've got to keep God supreme. God has got to be supreme in your life. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me, he cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first, and notice here again, I put it in red, count the cost. There is a cost that comes with following Jesus. There is a cost that comes with receiving him as your Lord and Savior and receiving his salvation and his gift of eternal life. Count the cost whether he has enough to finish it. Lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider 
whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. Or else while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that uh, he has cannot be my disciple. So there is, there is a cost that comes. Mary, Mary there, was a, there was a tremendous cost that she was being confronted with. A tremendous honor. And what does Mary do? And this is the, the beauty, the beauty of, of, again, her submission. Behold the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. You know what the word there for maidservant is? The word is doulos. Especially doulos, doulos is servant, and it says actually the idea is, is it's servant in the feminine. The concept of a servant, a doulos, in the Old Testament, if you go to Exodus chapter 21, a person is serving their master, an indentured servant. They became in debt to their master. So slavery in the Old Testament is, is, is indentured servants. If you owed somebody a debt, you had to pay them. It wasn't taking somebody and forcing them into slavery. You were essentially, you, you had a debt to pay, and the way you would do that, you become their servant for seven years. Pay off the debt. At the end of the seven years, the servant says, this, this, this master has been so good to me. He has loved me, my family, my wife. He has loved us so much. That I, I don't want to leave. He's given us a house to live in. He's given us money. He's given us a great job. We've got we've got animals. We've got livestock. We've got we've got you know we're growing crops. He says I want to stay and I want to serve him. I love him. So he goes to the master and says I want to be your servant for the rest of my life. The master takes him, pierces his ear with an owl, and then he becomes his servant for the rest of his life. That's what Mary is saying here. She is saying I love the Lord so much. I am so in love with God. That yes, I will be his maidservant and submit to him. Hmm. So let it be to me according to your word. What does that remind you of? Hmm. Who else said let it be? Her son. <laughs> In the Garden of Gethsemane. When he, when, when he prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, but not my will, well, but yours be done. done. And he submitted and he surrendered to the Father. Because of that, we're here and we're saved. So Mary, Mary had a submit, she had a submissive heart. Second thing I want you to notice, Mary had a heart of worship. And when you, you come to chapter 1, verse 46 through 45, this is called the Magnificat. And it's a song. It's, it's, a song, it's a song of praise. In fact, there's, there's some great songs of praise that deal with Christmas. And uh, you have a, a song of praise um, that is, is given, okay, essentially by Zacharias, who was uh, the father of John the Baptist, and you have here, this is Mary's song, and, and just, I'll read you, and Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord. Well, let me just ask you, do you know what, what, what does that mean? You know, these words, exalt the Lord, glorify the Lord, um, magnify the Lord. How can you magnify God? You can't make God bigger than he is. So it's not, it's not about making God bigger, it's about us essentially taking uh, essentially a magnifying glass of our soul and just seeing God as he is. Mm. It's getting a bigger picture of who he is. It's not, it's not making him bigger. It's just simply us being able to see more of God. My soul magnifies the Lord. I'm seeing, she's saying, I'm seeing the greatness of, of, of the Lord, the greatness of God, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. For he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. And this is very personal, right? Now she's dealing just, she's, she's praising God for regarding her. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. For mm. he who is mighty has done great things for me. And holy is his name. Mm. His mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm, and he has scattered the proud in the imaginations of their heart. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he has uh, spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. So it's a beautiful picture. By the way, if you want to learn really how to worship, just read the Psalms every day and meditate on them. If you really want to understand what, what true worship is, read the Psalms, because that, that is God's song book. That is God's worship book. You have 150 Psalms. And again, just, just sprinkled throughout the scriptures are psalms like this. This is a great worship psalm. It's a picture of a young girl under the inspiration of the Spirit who has a beautiful heart of worship. And she's praising God 
for his blessing. She's praising God for his mercy. She's praising God for his righteousness. Now, the, scripture, the scripture tells us, Jesus said in, in John chapter 4, 23, But the hour cometh now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. What does it mean to worship the Father in spirit and in truth? Because I believe what you have here, Mary is worshiping the Father in spirit and she's worshiping the Father in truth. She's worshiping the Father in spirit. She's worshiping from her heart. There's, there's passion. There's, there, there, there's love. There's adoration flowing from Mary. And she's worshiping the Father in truth. God in truth. What does that mean? She's worshiping the true God. She's worshiping the God who created all. She's worshiping the God, worshiping the God of, of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. And i got to say this to you. Read through the Old Testament because this is unique. Mm. Because the people who God called and the people who God chose were notorious idolaters. You read the prophets. I'm in Jeremiah right now and I just finished up 2 Kings. And the judgment of Babylon and Assyria have come upon Israel and upon um, the, 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 the uh, Judea and Benjamin. And it's come upon them because they were worshiping Baal and Ashtoreth. They're worshiping demons. They're worshiping false gods. They're worshiping their own imaginations. They're standing there and saying, hey, we're fine with God. We're, you know, we're, we're right with God. While they, you know, they have an Asherah pole in the, in the backyard. While they're going to the temple of Baal. While they're offering their children up to, to Dagon and Chemosh. And they're practicing occultic practices. To worship in truth is to worship the true God of the Scripture according to His Word. Here are just two passages here. A passage of Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 and 5. The Shema, which every little boy who makes a bar mitzvah or a girl makes a bas mitzvah. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Baruch ata Adonai. And brings up God to a bar mitzvah. This is Baruch Ata Adonai. It's, it's, it, this is a picture of what it is to worship God in spirit. To worship God in, in spirit is to worship Him with your heart, with your soul, with your might. There's a passion, there's a love in it. Then to worship God in truth. You, just, you, you take the first three commandments, this is a picture of what it is to worship God in truth. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Mary had the one true God before her, Yahweh. The God, the God of the Tanakh, again, the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Moses, the God of David. Not the God of Baal, not the God of Ashtoreth, the God of Chemosh, or one of the other gods. And thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. You know, I just want you to say, you, you shall not create an image Okay, of God, or you shall not create an image. Let me just say this, a false image in your head. <laughs> I, I'm listening to a guy the other day saying, well, you know what, I, I really don't believe that a, a God of love could um, send people to hell and judge them. Well, what he just did was he created God in his own image. You don't believe. Because what the scripture says, that there is a God of great love, and he is a true God, and he will judge people who have rejected the very salvation that he has offered. So that's created, creating that. Mary, Mary did not create a, a, a God of her own imagination. When you talk to people, you witness to people, they have a God of their own imagination. They will share with you that they believe in God. Most people believe in God, but it's a God of their own imagination. It's not the God of the, the very revelation of Scripture. Most of you, they created God in their own image, in their own likeness. They, the, the, what they like, they, they, they kind of, you know, include, and what they don't like, they throw out. And thou shalt not take the Lord's name in vain. And when we think of people taking the Lord's name in vain, we think of them, you know, taking, you know, they, they say GD or they say JC. And that, that, is, that is true. That is blasphemy of the Lord. But to take the Lord's name in vain, essentially, is, is just to go through the motions and not to mean it. It's, it's like to go through the motions and not have your heart in it. Or to go through the motions and have no intent of obeying God. Think about that. Like people just go, they go to church, they, they, you know, they, act, they act all right, but they have no intention of obeying God. That's basically taking the Lord's name in vain. I'll tell you something, I think that's most of Christianity today. 
People go to church and they, there's no intent of really obeying him. Mary, she worshipped the true, she worshipped the true God. And her concept of him, there wasn't an imaginary um, you know, image that she had. She was the true God. And she didn't take his name in vain. You can see, right, her heart was absolutely devoted to God. The uh, third thing I want you to look at here, Mary's humble heart. And in verses uh, 1 through 7 of chapter 2, let me read this to you. And again, notice, notice the humility of both Joseph and Mary. I have to say the humility of Mary. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world would be, uh, should be registered. And this census first took place while Quirinius uh, was the governing uh, Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own uh, city. Joseph also went up to Galilee, uh, up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was the head of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. It was, uh, while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And here's the, the thing, this is where we get a whole picture of the setting of where, where the Messiah is born. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And that's, that's a pretty humbling thing. Could you imagine? You, know, you, get, you, get a, you can have a baby now, you go to go to the hospital, those of you who have had children, you know this. You go to the hospital, you're in this sterile environment, everything is sterilized, the doctors are sterilized, you've got doctors and nurses around you, Basically, Joseph delivered this baby in a stable. Have you been in a stable lately? When we went to Israel, we were... Who was who's with me in Israel? So, besides you, anybody else here who was with me in the River? Remember we were in the caves? The, the shepherd's caves? Remember when I scared the, uh, the guy? <laughs> there was this... We were in the shepherd's cave... And that's where they were. The, the sheep were kept in caves. Jesus was born in a cave. He there, there, was, there were no wooden stables. And these caves were, were very likely the caves we were walking in. One of them is one, where he was born because built above them, the archaeologists found that there was an inn that goes back to the uh, first century. So we're walking in the caves, and I, I kind of snuck around into this dark part of the cave, and I realized as I'm walking through that, it wrapped around. And basically, I come walking out, and the guide's there with all of our people, and I come walking out of the dark, and, and I said, there's no room in the inn. <laughs> and it's the poor guy, the guy, he, 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 almost, he almost jumped out of his clothes. I'm, I'm terrified. He was ready to freak out. He was shaking. He was shaking for quite a while, and he, he sees this person come away. He thought it was a ghost or something, you know. I don't know where his, where his, his, his belief was, but it's it's a it's a essentially it's a stable, and the sheep poop all over the place. There's hay on the ground, and Joseph had to clean up some of this, and he had to you know make, make put down some fresh hay, make it as clean as he could. But it is an incredibly humbling experience. There are some people who are too big to be used by God. And I've seen them through the years in this place. They're too big. They're too important. They think, they think too much of themselves. And they are, too, they are too big to be used by God. About, about 18 years ago, we hired a, an associate pastor here. And the first day that he started, for Tuesday morning, I said to him, we have to go set up chairs for a Bible study tonight. And we went uh, into the area where um, the, kids, the kids had their worship. And um, we're setting up chairs. And he looked at me and he said, I didn't come on here to set up chairs. Well, he was gone very shortly. And you know what? He's still studying for the ministry 20 years later. And he still has never been hired by a church. I wonder why? Some people just they're just too big to be used by God. Hey Lou, do we set up chairs? <laughs> do we do plumbing, <coughs> roofing, cleaning gutters, vacuuming, flooding, whatever, you know, look, a lot of people are doing things here and we have people that work here, but you do what you, you do what you have to do. God, God, you, you see this throughout the Old Testament that God has to bring people down before he can bring them up. And there's a humbling that he will uh, bring into a person's life before he can actually use the person. You can see this. You can see this, and you can look at this with um, with numerous. Look at Joseph. 
God had to bring Joseph down. Now, Joseph was a little prideful when he said to his brothers, you know what, listen, I had a dream, and I see you all kneeling down before me, and I even see mom and dad kneeling down before me, and he's, you know, strutting around in his coat of many colors, and there was pride there. And God brought Joseph low, right? He sold as a slave into, uh, into you know, to the Midianites, and they brought him into Egypt, and Joseph had faith, and Joseph always acted in accordance with what God had placed upon his life as calling. So he rises up, and he becomes the head of Potiphar's wife. Potiphar's wife tries to seduce him, then he's put in jail. He rises up, and he becomes the second-in-command of the jail under the warden. And then he becomes the second-in-command of the most powerful man in the world, and he really is the second most powerful world, a man in the world, because the Egyptian Empire was the most powerful empire in the world at this time. So God raised him up, but he had to bring him low to raise him up. Same thing goes with Moses. Moses is so, is so full of himself and all the Egyptian wisdom, right? He goes to kill the guy, then he gets exiled. Forty years. Forty years serving, right, and growing in the Egyptian kingdom, thinking it was someone, and then 40 years out in the desert, realizing that he was no one, and then God is able to take him and really turn him into somebody. But you see this over and over again throughout the Paul. Paul had to get knocked off of his high horse, get knocked on his face before God, be blinded for three days, before God could really get a hold of him. And then what God did is people think, well, Paul, Paul went right to work. God took him out into the desert for a couple of years. But he had to go low before he could go high. And, and Mary's, again, she's a picture of, of this person. Uh, number four. Mary's heart was filled with wonder. I said this about Joseph last week. In Luke chapter 2, verse 15 through 20. So when the angels had gone away, so the, the angels appeared to the shepherds, and then the shepherds were running into Bethlehem. So when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord made uh, known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning the child. And this is them telling, they told Mary, angels, a chorus of angels appeared to us out in the shepherd's field. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But notice this is, but Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. The word, the word there, ponder, is, is santero, and it means to cherish. It means, it means to delight with, with a sense of awe and a sense of wonder. When God, when God has revealed something to you, how many of you find yourself just, God is, God is revealing things to you in your life. He's revealing things through his word. He may be revealing something through, through a sermon, through, through a worship song, through experience, through circumstances. And you walk around and you cherish it in your heart. When you find yourself at night, you wake up in the middle of the night, you're, you're, you're thinking upon these things. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart, and the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. But I Mary is a woman, she has, she has the santero, she has that, that heart that just cherishes the precious blessings of God. I believe that was happening even before and the angel Gabriel had visited her. Let me just, I want to show you a psalm we, we we launched uh, two years ago, our, our, this was our, our church year psalm. Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. Blesses the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scornful. But watch this. But his delight is in what? Hmm. The law of the Lord. His delight is in the word of God. His delight is in the, 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 the word of God. And notice, and in his law he meditates day and night. He's thinking upon it. He's pondering. It's, it's again, it's the santero. And he shall be like a tree planted by rivers of water that bring forth its fruit in season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he does prospers. Uh, number five. Mary had a, a strong heart. So Mary and Joseph, on the eighth day, take Jesus up to be dedicated, and uh, they are met by this man named Simeon, who was a prophet, and, um, he's a wonderful character, he's one of my favorite characters in scripture, and Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him, and it says, and then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against. 
Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also. That the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. I want you to notice that, yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also. What is that talking about? The cross. Who do you think hurt more standing at the cross of everybody who was there? Yeah, there's no, there's no question. It's not, even, it's not even close. Imagine having a son like Jesus. You never had to ask him to take out the garbage. It was done. He never disobeyed. He never talked back. Right? He just is, he, he's, he's the, the, this, this perfect, he's the perfect young man. He's this perfect man of God. And there is Mary, right? And there is the sword piercing her soul. And she has to watch her son. Watch the son of God. And she has to watch him die on that cross. If you've seen some of the movies and you've seen the Nativity, or I'm sorry, if you've seen uh, The Passion of the Christ or Jesus of Nazareth, when he's taken down from the cross and you see Mary holding him in his arm, man, if it'll make you cry, I don't know what will ever make you cry. But God had to select somebody who was really strong for this. And that strength, that strength is there when she's 14 years old and Gabriel is speaking to her. And that strength is there when we had come back now, she's probably 44 years old or 47 years old when Jesus is crucified. And she is there. And she has this strength. And God had to take a woman. She, he had to select somebody who has great strength. So here's our, here, here's our, here's our wrap up. And I'll wrap it up real quickly here. I think that, you know, when you look at, at Mary, and see, I, don't, I don't know, you know, you look at your heart, and something that I prayed so much when I was newly saved was God use me. I just pray that, I, I just plead with God, God, just use me however you want, in any, in any way that you want, anyhow, I want to be used by you. I don't, want, I don't want to waste my life. I don't, want to, I don't want to sit on the sidelines while the game is going on in the field. I don't want to be a spectator up in the stands. I want to be used by you, Lord, in any, in any way. That, that, that It doesn't matter. Just use me. And um, I think that that's a, that's a key thing. Mary had that heart to, you know, to say, use me. And I think that's key to be available to God. Who does God use? Who does God take? People who want to be used by the Lord. Listen to what this lady, Marala Scott, said. She said, when you submit and make yourself available to God, you will realize that God has always been available to you. That's, That's true. Mary, Mary's a, she's a, she's a woman who has a, a heart for God. I think God selected her. She had, she had a big heart for God. Maybe at the time, maybe, maybe the biggest heart on earth that God could find. And I really a, a prepared heart, because I believe God prepared her for this. But what, is it, what does it mean? Malachi talks about you know, a heart for God. What does it mean to have a heart for God? I'm going to show you just two, just two very simple things and make this as simple as I can. To have, to have a heart for God is to have a heart for His Word. That's, that's the way he communicates with us. That's his personal self-disclosure. That's how he reveals himself to us. That's how God is going to speak to you. God is going to speak to you through his word. We speak to God through prayer. But to have a, you know, to have a heart for his word, if you're, if you're not in his word, let me tell you that you don't have a heart for God. You're going to pray that God would ignite your heart. And to have a heart for God is, is to love Jesus. To be in a place where, you know, Jesus is the ultimate love of your life. And I'll just tell you something. Just the more you walk with him, the more you're going to realize that. And I'll tell you, the more, the more you fail, the more you're going to realize that. And it's really it's really easy. Oh, Lord, look at how good I am. Look at how much you love me. When you're failing him, when you're falling short, he's always there. He's always loving you. Though you're unfaithful, he's always faithful. And you fall in love with him. And loving him and loving his word, man, that's that. I mean, that's that's what it is to have a heart for God. Mary had a heart for God. And I think when you look for look at Joseph, Joseph had a heart for God. And that's why God selected, he selected these two people to be the, the mother of his son's humanity and the stepfather of his son, of his son's humanity. 
And what a great privilege, right, to, to, to have. I'll just tell you, I'll tell you this, this one final story. If you can ever, if you can find somewhere the movie A.D., and I have it, and I, I did not bring it with me tonight, but there is a scene in the movie A.D. where they're waiting for the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, you know, the 120 in the upper room. And, um, and Mary is there. And she's telling the, the, the apostles, she's telling the crowd about Jesus. Imagine the things she could have said, the things she could have shared about Jesus. Like she's telling, so she's telling them a story about when Jesus was a little boy, and she says that he, he stuck his finger on, his, um, on a nail, and then he began to cry. And she said, what I did was I went over and I comforted him, and she goes, I gave him, I gave him some bread, like bread with jelly. And she goes, and he was woofing it, like he woofed it down. You see the little kid woofed down, uh, my, my grandson this morning, he had three pieces of French toast and two pancakes. And his stomach was like so protruded that his mother touched his stomach and said, no more Giancarlo, your stomach's gonna burst. He eats so much for breakfast. And he doesn't eat a lot the rest of the day. But woofing, Mary says, he was woofing, he was woofing his bread. And then Peter, Peter, uh, John looks at her and he says, woofing. Like just the amazement, almighty oh God. Is, is, a, is a little child moving his bread. And then Mary says, you never know. And Peter just then says, you never know. Like the mysteries and the wonder of God of how he just breaks into our lives at times. And then all of a sudden, the wind begins to blow. And the Holy Spirit comes. Like you never know. God is a God of miracles. God is a God of wonder. When we're open to him, those wonders can happen. It comes something that's happening for you right now. It comes into our lives. So let's pray and thank you, Lord, for this wonderful word. And thank you, Lord God, for the blessing that we see in two people, Lord God. We know, Lord God, they were not perfect. We know they were sinners and they needed a Savior. But, Lord God, we look to them and we learn from them as we do through the characters of Scripture. And we see in Joseph and Mary, Lord God, just many, many good characteristics. And we know, Lord, and we understand why that you would select these two and prepare these two to be, Lord God, uh, the parents, the surrogates that would look over your son while he walked the earth, Lord. And I want to pray, Lord God, that we would take to heart these things, and Lord God, we would take to heart, Lord God, that we would have a heart like Joseph and Mary, that, Lord God, is open to being available to whatever you have for us, to be about your business and about your will. And, Lord God, to have a heart that's in your word and to have a heart, Lord, that's growing more and more in the love of your son. And Jesus, we thank you. And we ask the blessing upon us as we go into prayer. And Father God, may your blessing, Lord God, and your spirit just guide us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, okay, folks, as you go into prayer tonight, right now with what's happening in the world, these next couple of prayer meetings could be some of the most important things that you ever pray. The Middle East is about to explode. Iran, Iran and Saudi Arabia are right now going at it. I don't know if you know that. The rockets are being fired. The Iranians fired a rocket that basically hit the uh, airport today. And then they fired a rocket that went towards the palace to kill the, uh, the king of uh, Saudi. But they're going, we, we back Saudi, Russia backs Iran. North Korea is, is just, I'm telling you, the world has, we have not had a period where I think there is greater risk and danger in my lifetime Okay, in my lifetime, I think the threat right now is greater than the Cold War when we were pointing, uh, you know, 15,000 nukes between us and Russia. I'm just telling you, this, this is right now, it, it, it is a very, um, I said it's outside of the Lord, it's a scary time. And we need to pray. Pray for, pray for the peace of the Middle East. Pray for peace to come to the peninsula of Korea. You know, pray, pray that there would be a, a, a peace that can, because I believe that God can, can, God can hear our prayers. And he can act. So I just want to encourage you, be in prayer tonight about some of these things, and you have many other things that you'll pray. So let's break up, break up, and let's go into, uh, into prayer.